The story that we've been working through, Israel has been enslaved in Babylon in captivity for 50 years, and God uses the three leaders that we've been looking at with different assignments to rebuild in Jerusalem. Zerubbabel rebuilds the temple, Ezra again rebuilds uh, belief and knowledge of the Torah, and Nehemiah rebuilds the city walls. And we've been focusing a lot on Nehemiah and his leadership and how he engages uh, God in rebuilding. Before Nehemiah shows up in the story, though, Ezra had been teaching and trying to reframe uh, Torah for them, the first five books of the Bible and how to follow God. He had been doing that for 15 years. He had been trying to do this with the exiles. And Nehemiah is not even on the scene yet. At this time, what is Nehemiah? Nehemiah is a cupbearer to King Artaxerxes. Nehemiah is living well in its capital, Susa. Nehemiah is considered both a friend and a person of influence within the, within the kingdom. He's, he's not just somebody disposable, considering he would be so close to King Artaxerxes at all times. And you have to be trusted. Somebody who is going to take your drink and, and uh, make sure it's not poison. You don't, uh, you don't just want to, you know, have anybody do that and trust that they're going to make sure you're safe. You need somebody trusted in that position to look after your welfare. So Nehemiah was, was on good terms and in influential terms with Artaxerxes. And then one day in this time, Hanani comes with others from Judah. And Nehemiah asks a question. He's checking in on seeing how things are going because he would have had reports over what's been going on through Zerubbabel and Ezra. And he says this in Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. It says, And I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, The remnant there in the province who had survived the exile, is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. He asks the question, how are they doing? What's going on? Are things well? But they're not. There's great trouble and shame amongst them. And it's in this moment, it's in that, that time right there, where Nehemiah is confronted with an injustice and God blesses him with a burden to fight for because he hears what's going on and something is triggered inside of him. We've got to know that this is 15 years that Ezra has been teaching. Zerubbabel has been building the temple. So it's not like he didn't know that there were things going on and this is his first report ever hearing of what's going on. But in this moment, at this time, when he hears it, God gives him a burden. Now, we can often be confronted with opportunities that want to provoke a fight within us, provoke us to fight. Injustice, ooh, that was louder. Injustices and tyranny. Now I can really preach, right? You can hear me well, right? <laughs> Injustices and tyranny that seem to demand a response in our current culture. Don't we see that all the time where people want to try to take a stand or try to influence? In this cultural moment that we're living in, it is very evident that people have projects, stands, moments where, oh, maybe I can just take your mic and grid. This one's driving me crazy. here. All right. Okay. We're good now. No more crinkling and ear falling. All right. So where was I? Yes, our cultural moment. Isn't there times, though, where you can see it around you and maybe it burns inside you, where you see something going on and you want to respond. You want to fight for it. You want to say, I demand justice. That needs to change. And whether it's on Facebook or whether it's with your, your group of friends or whether you go and protest, something inside you fires up and you want to make a difference. You want to stand up for change. It's very evident in our culture today that people have burdens they want to fight for. They have things that they want to see change. They have, they have issues and dynamics in our culture. They have things 
things that they think need or no need to be justified or changed. And here's the thing. When you're blessed with a burden, where you look next is absolutely pivotal. What you do after God gives you that burden or you see that injustice that needs to be fought for, what you do next, where you turn next is absolutely pivotal. Look where Nehemiah turns next in Nehemiah 1.4. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Now we often feel like action is needed and it should be an immediate awe and shock response where we just need to get out there and we need to do it right now. And we'll think about the logistics afterwards, but we need to go and make the difference right now, right now. It, it demands an immediate response because our offense to it is really strong. Our emotional response to the injustice, to the fight, the burden that God's put on our hearts is strong. Too often, though, our desire for justice, what we're really looking for, is consequences and judgment and punishment, which isn't justice at all. The pivotal step is to turn to God, to do what we see him do there, to mourn, to pray, and to wait on God for what's next. That should be our response and now the, another pivotal step in the fight, uh, the right fight when we look at injustice is the step between when and where. Now, how many of you guys have seen this either in a TV show or movie or uh, hopefully not in your own personal life? You know, the, the schoolyard fight, right? Where somebody comes up, the bully usually comes up to some poor kid and is like, after school, playground, you know, and you see that scene play out, right? Where it's like, when and where, three o'clock after school, in the playground, we're fighting. Between then, those two moments, right? It could be all day. When you see it on TV, it's all day, that little kid dreading that moment of, of three o'clock in the playground, and they're, they're peeking out the door, looking after school to see whether they can get out without a fight actually happening. That moment in between, though, is, is pivotal. Now, we can joke around about a, a, a little schoolyard tussle in a, in a movie or a TV show, or hopefully, again, like not in your real, your real life. We can joke around about those things, but in reality, the idea between knowing there's a fight and knowing where and when that fight is going to be in between is absolutely pivotal. Between where and when, Nehemiah does something we saw last week as well, in which we see clearly in the prayer that he gives, uh, he makes before God. He makes the fight personal. He makes it personal, but it's not all about him. So many times we want to make the fight personal and we, we take it personally and like we're personally offended and they've done something to us. And again, what does that do but rear up our desire for punishment and, and justice that doesn't look like justice at all. It doesn't look like making things right between groups of people. It makes it look like one group has got to pay for what's going on. But let me, let me read what the prayer is in Nehemiah in verse 1-6, it says this, Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. Between the when and where, Nehemiah steps towards God with ownership and faith, with ownership and faith. Too many times in our cultural moments, we don't want to take ownership for the way things are. We see injustice happening around us and we want to blame somebody else for it. How could that happen? And yet, the last time I checked, we're all a part of our culture and our society today. When something manifests so bad in our culture that we, it becomes apparent that's an injustice, that means there was 15, 20 steps, 30 steps before that that we were inactive in stopping it from becoming that injustice. There's guilt enough to go around 
And what Nehemiah does is that, in that moment is he owns his peace. He owns his father's peace. He owns the previous generation's peace that led to the moment where they are a remnant in Israel, in Jerusalem, without walls, with a temple that's just been rebuilt in a Torah that they're, they're struggling to understand. He takes ownership for what has gone on. It continues in verse 8 and 9. It says, Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are faithful, I will scatter you. Uh, if you are unfaithful, sorry, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the utmost parts of heaven, and from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. Again, we see in the dwell there, God's presence. So what does he do? Blessed with a burden, Nehemiah turns first to God, takes ownership of the problem, but in faith, what does he do? He reminds God of his promises, of his word. We absolutely know that God is a God of justice, that he is a God of love, that God wants to see everybody treated fairly. And Nehemiah does what's needed to be done in order to be able to approach God like that. He takes ownership of his portion first. He takes ownership for the community. And he says, we've done wrong. We weren't faithful. We we have been scattered. The exact thing you said would happen if we were unfaithful has happened. And here we are. And we repent of that. And now we return to following you, to looking at your commandments and keeping them. And now Nehemiah is prepared to lead as his motives are in the right place. How many times are we actually not really prepared to fight because our motives aren't in the right place? We have, we have a burden. We know there's a fight that we want to we wanna, we wanna go out and engage in, but our motives aren't quite right. We're still picking sides in the battle. We're still seeing one side versus the other, saying they're being mistreated and they need to be punished. We haven't got the right motives of working through the matter. Because when it comes to knowing the right fight and how to fight, motives do matter. Think about whatever battle that it is you have, whatever fight that you, that you would want to engage in, can I ask you these questions? Why do you seek justice? What are you looking for? Are you looking for retribution? Are you looking to make them pay? Are you looking to see somebody get what they deserve? Are you looking to to right a wrong only on one side of the scale by by taking away something from somebody that looks like they've they've got it uh, unfairly? Why do you seek the justice you seek and what does it look like? I would suggest to you today that true justice looks less like punishment and more like fulfilling the obligations of relationship. Justice for the poor, the marginalized, the abused isn't about just punishing those who have created that reality. It looks at what we need to do in order to put the poor, marginalized, or abused back in a right relationship within the community. The Hebrew, in the Hebrew, there's a word that's often used for righteousness and justice. And the word is tzedakah. And when you, if you were to research it and look at that word throughout the Bible, Every time it mentions that word, it uses that word, it speaks about how to engage properly in relationship with God and others. How a righteous man or woman would act as far as giving and being kind and caring and compassionate and looking after people. Or how a righteous person interacts with God and obeys God and follows God. But the root of the word is is, is. It's, it's found in just that idea of what is needed, what is needed, what is the obligation of relationship? In my relationship with you, in order for it to be good, in order for it to be righteous and there to be justice and right standing between us, what obligation do I need to, to do? What does love demand of me in order to fulfill that relationship? And when we look at justice and righteousness in our world, 
I believe if we took that perspective on things, what is needed to fill the obligation of relationship in this scenario and then work towards that end, we would find true justice. Righteousness is fulfilling that obligation of relationship with God, while justice is fulfilling that obligation of relationship with others. And when we're in right standing with God and in right standing with others, we're living that out. Which is why we see Jesus. He tells us, doesn't he, in in the New Testament, what are the greatest things that we're supposed to do? What two commandments or what commandments is the greatest of all? Love God and what? Love others. Everything else hangs on those two things. 613 rules and laws that God put in the Old Testament that were to be fulfilled. All of them, all the justice and righteousness that is included in everything that God gave as an edict, a precept, a rule for them to follow, hung on two things, love God and love others. The obligation of relationship right there. Everything hangs on that. Justice hangs on that. Our burden and our fight hang on that. Do we love others and love God? And is that the motive for our fight? Another step in knowing the right fight is is this. Embracing. Am I willing to count the cost? Am I willing to count the cost? See, Nehemiah, what did he have to do but put his position in jeopardy. The burden that was so on him was affecting his ability to, to, to uh, serve the king. And the king noticed. And the king's like, why are you downcast? You, you're not your normal self. You're, you're acting a little different, Nehemiah. What's going on with you? And he has a choice. He can share this burden that's put on his heart and see how it affects what's going to happen with his relationship with King Artaxerxes. He has to count that personal cost before he steps into that fight. The cost personally getting into the fight can be great. We don't know all the risks and rewards of jumping in, but we need to go into it knowing that there will be a cost. Because the cost can be great. But there's also a cost that can involve others. And there's a cost that can involve opposition. You see, Nehemiah knows what needs to be done, but knows he can't fulfill the vision alone. Everyone has to play a part in rebuilding the walls. And we see this in chapter 3. Yet like any rebuilding, there are obstacles and opposition that Nehemiah has to face. In Nehemiah 4, verses 7 to 9, it says this, But when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the uh, Ashadites heard that the repairing of the walls of Jerusalem were going forward and that the breaches were being, uh, beginning to be closed, they were very angry. As they would always go and maraud and pillage and everything like that in Jerusalem. And now that the walls were being fortified, they would lose their ability to go in and just take what they wanted in that circumstance. And they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause confusion in it. And we prayed to our God and set a guard as a protection against them day and night. See, Nehemiah faces expected opposition from outsiders. Those outside the community try to stop them because they're looking after their own interests and know that a strong Israel, a strong Jerusalem would not be good for them. And we can often face opposition. But remember, our opposition is what? What do we just go through in our, our spiritual conflict series? All conflict is spiritual conflict. And that even when there's a person standing in front of you trying to offer conflict, there is a spiritual connection behind it. And that we want everybody to know and love God and and understand our heart and passion for God, including those that stand in opposition to us. People will want to stop you, harm you, derail you, just because of the stance you take. But we got to realize we just keep moving forward. We see the opposition, but we see it for what it is, a spiritual battle. 
And as they begin to, re they begin to rebuild the wall, there's another threat. And this one's not external. Sometimes it's easy for us to deal with external threats and we can understand it, we can see it and go, I see that somebody doesn't, uh, doesn't appreciate what God is doing here. And, and, and to God be the glory, we know we need to keep going. We, need, we know we need to keep moving forward and we're going to do so as gracefully as possible. But then there was another problem that Nehemiah faced. And this threat wasn't from outside, it was from inside. Because there was oppression from the insiders. See, the Torah taught in Deuteronomy 15.1 that no Jewish brother should enslave or exploit another. But no such law existed in Babylon. Doing the opposite is actually what got Babylon ahead. And as the walls were being built, there's a lending of money that is taking place, but they're charging each other interest and a great amount of interest within Jerusalem, within the community of believers. Because what they had done was they had adopted all, the, all the, uh, the ways of Babylon. And a great outcry arises in the, in the city and, and because of the burden being placed on them by the rich that are, that are lending to those that are, that are poorer in the community and the interest they're charging on them. It's, it's, it's becoming too much. And there's an outcry, and they're raising up, and, and they're saying, wait a minute, who needs enemies when you have friends like this? How can we build the wall when we're, we're, we're half the time we're trying to pay back interest on these loans that we've gotten? But look how Nehemiah responds. He responds by living in the opposite spirit. And so in this moment, he has the authority to speak. In Nehemiah 5, 9 to 10, he says this, so I said, the things that you are doing is not good. Ought you not to walk in the fear of our God to prevent the taunts of the nations of our enemies? Moreover, I and my brothers and my servants are lending them money and grain. Let us abandon this exacting of interest. Here's the thing. Nehemiah isn't offering charity. He's not just giving them anything without any, any expected return. He's expecting payment. He's just not looking to profit off of his vulnerable brothers and sisters. He's not looking to profit off of their position. He's not looking to oppress them because of the situation that he's in. Sometimes we can find ourselves in that, that tension where we want to do something in the opposition within, in the opposition to keep the status quo, in the opposition to not want to get outside of where we're comfortable or what's good for us or the, the power or the influence or the, uh, the lifestyle that we have would be disrupted by change. And so we look to maybe slow things down or change things or bog things down rather than experience the change because we didn't do what I'd said earlier. We didn't count the cost. We didn't count the cost to know that, that change and, going and getting into a fight is going to cost something. Now between these two external, the, the external opposition and the internal oppression, Nehemiah, because he knew where to turn first and when to step in to the fight with the right motives, he's able to handle the situation with righteousness and justice. He, know, he knows who has true authority, and so he deals with the external threat in authority, but he also wants justice and appeals through relationship to bring wholeness to the relationships within their community. And so our question today is, can we do the same can we put up a shield of faith when we're dealing with external opposition? Do we need to, stand, to, to attack or stand firm in the authority that we have? Can we make that stand when we need to, when we're facing external opposition? And yet at the same time, can we lovingly deal with those within our community, correcting those who are bringing pain? Can we look to restore relationship, if at all possible? In fighting the right fight, you never know when today's principled decisions will give you authority to step into tomorrow's problems. Nehemiah 6, 15 to 16. So the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month of Elul in, the, in 52 days. They finished the wall in 52 days around the whole city. 
I don't care how small the city is, building a stone wall in 52 days sounds like quite an accomplishment. And when all of our enemies heard it, all the nations around us were afraid and fell, fell greatly in their own esteem, for they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. When we build, and when we allow God to build, and when we build the right way, knowing how to fight, what fights to be in, looking to bring righteousness and justice the proper way through those fights, God will build his house. And when God builds his house, our spiritual enemy will recognize what's happening and will lose esteem in his own eyes and recognize what God is doing in this place. And that we do so with the help of our God. So Nehemiah, he's an outstanding study in leadership. Being blessed with a burden, knowing the right fight, and doing, uh, and doing what you should do with God's help when you're called to do it. Now here's the thing for every single one of us here. Our role is critical. Your role in this fight is critical but you can only play your part. Your role isn't everything. My role isn't everything. There's room for only one hero in our story. And it's Jesus. There's room for only one person that can build this church, that can be the presence within this church that allows us to be and do what we're trying to do. For Life Center to be all that it can be, it'll take your time, your treasure, your talent. And yet Life Center will stop being all it can be the moment that we make it all about ourselves. There's so much that is broken in our world. There's so much that needs justice and righteousness to step in to be able to flourish. There's so much that needs rebuilding. There's so much that needs healing between us. If we live out just even the portion of the Lord's Prayer that says, on earth as it is in heaven, if we're working with God towards that, there's so much that needs to be done. And so we find our burden. So like Nehemiah, we can do this. This is your four little take-home points. When blessed with a burden, first turn to God. When blessed with a burden, and God will put a fight on your heart, turn to God first. Mourn, pray, fast, look at how he wants to do things. Second thing, take ownership instead of dishing out blame. Instead of looking at all the reasons out there why something is the way it is, take account inside first to see what blame lies within so you can make that fight in the right way. Third thing, make principled decisions today so that with authority, you can step into tomorrow's problems. And the fourth thing, let it fully involve you, but don't make it all about you. Don't make it your battle. Don't make it your cause. Don't make it your fight that if you win this fight, then it's all good. Let it fully involve you, but not let it, don't let it be all about you. Because the world is tired. It's tired of people who make it all about them, who teach but don't do it themselves, who blame without taking any ownership, look to others to do what God is asking them to do. And that's not who we want to be. We don't want to be a church or a community of people that uh, when God places a burden on our hearts, we say somebody else will take care of it. The church down the street, they're closer to that problem. We'll let them deal with it. When God puts a burden on our hearts, both individually and corporately, we need to act. Today, uh, every week we've been working through, going through communion. Uh, and so if you have your communion elements with you, you can pull them out now. And if you didn't get communion elements, just raise your hand and uh, one of our guest services team will just uh, come to you with elements if you'd like to participate in communion with us this morning. And the focus uh, today that I would like to take for our communion 
Because if you noticed, every single week when we take communion, we, uh, we work through the scenarios of, of repenting and confessing before God for different aspects of how we, as a collective group or as individuals, uh, may have caused injustice or brokenness in the world around us. And today, um, our, in the past, we focused on um, racial inequality and, and things like that. And this week, we are focusing on generations. And our focus today is just to, to take a look inside and, and say, God, I want you to create a clean heart in me. And when it comes to how we look at different generations, generations that have gone before us and the generations yet to come, if there's anything in me that isn't honoring the relationship that I should have with those generations, let me just confess it and get it out today. If there's anything as a church where we have not provided for the next generation, we have not set the next generation up properly, let us confess and again, turn our focus to making sure that our life kids and our youth have everything they need to be inspired by God, to be inspired by who he is, to have his presence so rich in their lives that that life center is carried on through them in the years to come. We want to take our focus to the different generations. Because I think in, in this building at this moment, from our youngest to our oldest, we probably have five generations covered. But God, may your generations always fill this house and may we see them flourish because we make space for every generation. We honor every generation. We value every generation and we fight for every generation. So we appreciate the sacrifice of Jesus, which the bread and the cup symbolize. And Holy Spirit, we want to allow you to convict us where our hearts are inconsistent with the love of Jesus. And Jesus, we ask you to forgive us as we walk in the power of your love for us and others. Before we take, let's just pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you for giving your life for us. Forgive us for our sins and heal our hearts. Heal our land. Heal between generations. Help us to be more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The scripture says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the, right, on the night he, when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us partake now. God, we thank you for what you've done. We thank you for the burden that you had for humanity. We thank you that you chose that fight and that you fought it perfectly for us being our sacrifice so that we could be restored in relationship. God, you, you ultimately showed us what the obligation of relationship looked like, even to death on a cross. And so God, while we cling to what you've done for us on that cross, restoring that relationship with you, God, help us to understand what we have to do to fulfill the obligations of relationship with you and others. May love lead us and guide us. May your spirit empower us. And may your wisdom, Father, always be what we rely on to do so. We pray this in your name. Amen. As we close, uh, we've been working our way through and saying our Build Our House Declaration. 
So as our, our closing benediction, I pray you'd, uh, you'd join me as we read our declaration uh, again today. Jesus, help us to be more like you. Holy Spirit, empower us to be who you've gifted us to be. Father, teach us to abide in your love. Jesus, heal broken relationships, hearts, minds, and bodies. Teach us to rise early, pray fervently, and trust your word is ultimate truth. Give us hearts quick to surrender to you, strong to resist darkness, tender to others around us. Help us love, not judge. Build up, not break down. Let us love one another as you love us. Jesus, send revival and start in us. The harvest is ready, but the laborers are few. Lord, send us. Until heaven, or yeah, until earth looks like heaven, Holy Spirit, come. Lord, build your house. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Pastor. Amen.